player motivation. How do you motivate players to act? And that's very important, of course, that if you have players who do not have any motivation, then nothing will happen, because LARP is about, at least in my book, it's about the interaction between characters and how they connect to each other and how they work with each other or against each other. And there's a lot of ways of motivating people. This fader focuses on uh, two things. If you collaboratively uh, together decide what the lab is about or you agree upon what themes to explore or whatnot. When we did the intro game, it was quite collaborative. We all decided that, or it was decided amongst us that we would participate in this lab where it was about uh, exploring awkwardness in the 80s in the middle in, in a middle school in America and everybody pushed that in one direction um, as I said you could have uh, the same lab with the only thing different that the goal of the lab was to dance with most partners during the three songs so you move the fader to the other end of the spectrum uh, and when I say that the intro game was collaborative, of course, a lot of stuff was decided beforehand. So as you can see, co the connection between the faders, that if you move this fader all the way down to that everything is collaborative, then you also move uh, how much control the designers have over the process of theme or uh, characters and so on. So they are connected. So if you move one fader, then other faders will follow. Um, yes. Boom. When you have the fader to close to competitivity, then you get a very clear goals for your characters or in the in the game. So, uh, in the eighties, there was a very beautiful movie called Highlander, where people with swords that were immortal killed each other, and the tagline was "There can be only one." So all the immortal people with swords ran around and killed each other because there could be only one. That's a beautiful lab, it has been done. And of course, it is very clear that what you need to do is kill everybody else and you do not have to be killed. That motivates you quite easily. One, because you want to win. Two, because other people will come to you and try to kill you. So you will defend yourself. That is very simple game mechanics to push competitiveness in a game. What that of course do on the negative side is that if the only thing this game is about is about winning and being the last person alive, then you're motivated to cheat. And the more you have invested in a game, we have all tried this, that the more invested you are in something, the more tempting it is to cheat just a little bit. Maybe a little bit more, maybe a lot. It all depends of, of a lot of choices. And of course, a thing when it becomes very competitive, then my skills as a swordsman in the Highlander game uh, very clearly defines my chances of winning. If we are in the other end of the scale and we all collaborative had decided that I'm gonna win, it doesn't matter if I, if I can hold a sword or not, everybody else will help me win. So that's the big difference. So in the other end, Everybody is on par. Everybody agrees on what this is about. So uh, it is much more easy to get a coherent story, to help each other, to make sure that you reach the sort of themes that you want to reach. Everybody moves in the same direction and they will help each other to go in that direction. And this is a concept that I'm going to introduce now. It's called playing to lose. And when we say playing to lose, it means that when you're in the competitive scale, you never play to lose. When you're collaborative, co collaborating, it is interesting stories is not always about winning. Interesting stories could be about anything and everything. And if you decide that that's the story you're going to focus on and you're going to dig into that story, then it will become interesting. For example, if you play a marriage and you decide collaboratively in the beginning that this marriage will fail during the lab 
then that story is very interesting. You know that you're going to go to a place where you cannot be together anymore, but the journey to that is very interesting to experience. So it's a chance to experience stuff that you, is very difficult to achieve if you're trying to compete about it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Cool. Um, the negative side on, on this is that uh, it's, it's your investment in conflicts become lower because if you know that the, the marriage will end, then maybe you're not in, as invested in it. Or if you know that you're not going to be, the, there can be only one Highlander left, then your marriage is not as invested in the, in the sort of mechanics of it and winning. Uh, and often when you do stuff collaboratively, you, or you go to the lowest common denominator. So you have to agree on something by consensus and that rarely gives high spikes of intensity unless you're extremely focused uh, in the process. So that, that's a big pitfall in when you do stuff collaboratively is that you can end up with something that is bland and not interesting because you don't want to push anybody in any direction. When you put the fader in the middle, you get sort of a mix and you can motivate different people by doing different stuff. Um, and and that, that, again, reflects the two ends of it. So I think in most labs, uh, focus on one end or the other. But there's labs, of course, where you have both. But they're sort of working against each other. So things become a little bit tricky if you try to incorporate both collaborative and competitive play. It has been done, but it's, it's quite tricky. Thank you.